astroeology. It sounds similar to astrology, but it's not the same thing at all. Astrotheology is the religion based on the stars. Astrotheology is, of course, the basis for most religions that have ever existed on the earth, especially for Western religions today. Judaism and Christianity, for sure are based almost solely on astrotheology. So in order to understand this subject, which is the basis for world religions today, and especially Judaism and Christianity, the subject is called astrotheology. Theology is the study of, ology is the study of, and the, T-H-E, is God in Greek. So in Greek, the word God is the, T-H-E, or theo, study of, as I said, is ology. So you put the two together, the study of God is theology. And so what I'm saying is that our concepts of God are actually based on the heavens. The whole entire story of Judaism and Christianity is there's a story of the constellations of the zodiac, the heavenly movements of the planets. That's the basis for Christianity and Judaism. So it's a, it's a hell of a story when you begin to break down what these words mean and where the ideas have come from. Uh, so I wrote an article many years ago called Astrotheology. Actually, the name of the article is called The Greatest Story Ever Told, because this is the greatest story ever told. Uh, The Bible has been referred to as the greatest story ever told. And the reason why is because it is, in fact, the greatest story that's ever been told because it's the oldest story. It's the most ancient story that's ever been told by any civilization. And it's been redone, repackaged, and given to our modern-day world in what we call the Bible, Old and New Testament. Uh, So... (coughs) In this article that I wrote, The Greatest Story Ever Told, The Basis for All World Religions, or especially Western religion, uh, I'm going to read from the the intro before I get into the subject, because I think the intro says it very well to explain where we're going to start with this. Again, uh, again, I want to say that the study of God is theology, the, T-H-E, which gives us our word theater. We get the word theater from the God show, because in ancient Greek, uh, the Greeks had an open-air theater, an amphitheater, <clears throat> and every so often all the Greeks in, in the town would get together in this big open-air theater, and they would have uh, uh, plays and skits put on that would teach the people certain morals and ethical principles, etc. And so from that idea about how God operates in human life, uh, we get the word theology and theater, so that today a church is nothing more than a theater. It's, a, it's, a, it's the God show. You go in, you pay money, and you get a, you know, and, and you get the, a show, And when it's all over, you feel very good about yourself, and you feel very good about everything. Everything's right, and everything's holy. Never realizing it's just a show. It's just uh, it's just entertainment. It's the God show, theater. I want to get past the, the God show and get down to the actual facts of how our world religions came about. So let me start by reading the intro to my book that I wrote many years ago. The Judaic Christian Bible tells a wonderful story. It is, in fact, often referred to as the greatest story ever told. And so it is, and you're now about to find out why. In the New Testament of the Christian Bible, a provocative and most serious challenge is laid on the whole of Christianity. Since it bears directly on our subject, we will quote it. This is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 17 in the New Testament. It says, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the Christians. And he says, if, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. Yea, we are found as false witnesses of God. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you're yet in your sins. 
So, let's closely examine the original and conceptual foundations of the faith and then decide. But in order to do that, we must go back not 2,000 years to the birth of Jesus, but 10 to 15,000 years to the birth of modern man. For when one seeks to establish foundations, one must begin at the beginning. Many thousands of years ago, and what we refer to as the primordial world of the ancients, human life was a far different experience than what we enjoy today. While it is true that we have less documentation on that prehistoric world than we have on our own age, ample enough is known from the ancient writings to paint a rather clear picture of what our primitive ancestry was like. If we have learned anything at all, it is this, that the more we change, the more we stay the same. And nowhere is this more clearly demonstrated than in the history of man's quest for God and the ancient religions that we still keep holy today. According to the best understanding we have gleaned from the available records, life for our ancient forefathers was a mixture of wonder and fear, each day just finding food for one's family without becoming a meal yourself by the roaming predator animals, was a life and death struggle. But if you have ever found yourself on a dark, cold night with insufficient clothing and without a friend or family near, you could quickly see how fearful the darkness, cold, primordial nights could be. And then came winter. Now you've really got problems. (laughs) It was from these meager and distressful conditions of the human race that our long history for the search for God and meaning has come. Any evolution at its most accelerated rate is always agonizingly slow. But from the beginning, man's profound questions demanded answers. When no clear answers were forthcoming from the universe, man turned inward and developed his own answers. The study of this subject is properly called astrotheology, or the worship of the heavens. This is the first, the original, and the only, therefore the oldest and most respected story on earth. It did not take man very long to decide that in this world the single greatest enemy to be feared was the darkness of night and all the unknown dangers that came with it. Simply stated, man's first enemy was darkness. So once you begin to see how the ancient and prehistoric world viewed their life on the earth, we can understand how darkness was a fearful thing to primordial and ancient man and that the coming of the sun or the rising of the orb of day would, of course, be a great relief from the cold, fearful, frightening darkness of night, especially because of all the predator animals would go back into their caves and go back into their holes and leave the humans alone while the sun was out. And so the sun always represented uh, protection, warmth, life, because they realize, the ancient people realize, the sun creates uh, energy, which gives us energy to live. It also feeds the energy to plants so we can have food to eat. So the sun, uh, to go on with what I wrote, understanding this one fact alone, one can readily see why the greatest and most trustworthy friend the human race could ever have was by far heaven's greatest gift to the world the glorious rising orb of day, our sun. This is why today Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. So with this simple truth understood, that the sun is our risen savior, and of course the sun is your risen savior because it rises every morning to save you. Because if it doesn't rise, we're dead in about three weeks. So it is your risen Savior. And he is the light of the world. 
So with this simple truth understood, we can now begin to unravel the ancient and wonderful story. Today, as in all of mankind's history, it has once again been told anew. The story is the story of Christianity, the greatest story ever told. Now I'm going to uh, outline just bits and pieces of how this story developed. Because modern day Christianity says that the ancient peoples of the world were were primitive, that believed in all kinds of uh, mythologies and dreamt of all kinds of silly stories of mythology, and that they were sun worshipers. Well, in point of fact, that is not true. And the people, those ancient people, are not here today to defend themselves. So the actual fact of the matter is the sun was never perceived by any ancient civilization to be a god. The Native Americans will tell you that today, that they have a veneration of the sun, but they don't perceive the sun to be a god. They say, the ancient people said, <clears throat> that the sun represented the great qualities that could be attributed to God, to our Creator. The qualities that the sun brings to the world is the qualities that we would imagine comes from God. And so, um, first of all, darkness was the great enemy of the human family, and that every uh, so often the sun would rise, our risen Savior would come back and chase away the darkness. And so, the Bible talks about how the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Well, the glory is a word for the sunburst. This is why uh, when kings and queens are crowned in Europe, the, the uh, event is called the coronation of the king or queen. Coronation comes from the word corona, which is the sunburst. When a child draws a sun coming up in the morning, You'll see the sun, and then you'll see little spokes, which represent the uh, sun rays. Well, the spokes are what was referred to as the corona, or the glory of God, the sun. Well, this is why Jesus is said to have died with a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns are the sun rays that you will see on the Statue of Liberty. She wears a crown of thorns. So the sun rays are the crown of thorns that Jesus died with because he was God's son, S-U-N. And he dies every night, every evening he dies and leaves the whole world in the hands of the prince of darkness, which was uh, the devil. So when you talk about God and the devil, you need to understand that you take an O out of the word good and it becomes God. God is good. And you take a, the letter D and put it in front of the word evil, and it becomes devil. Devil is simply a D in front of the word evil. So <clears throat> the scripture says in the Old Testament that uh, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. That's from Matthew 4 and 2. And then in uh, Matthew 4, 16, in the New Testament, it says God's son, he is risen. And so in the Old Testament, it says the sun, S-U-N, the sun of righteousness will arise. Well, in the New Testament, it says God's son, Jesus, is risen. So the Bible is equating Jesus with the sun. He is the light of the world. So it becomes uh, obvious that the sun is an appropriate symbol to represent God and that it gives the world light, it gives wisdom, knowledge, um, if you can't learn anything in the, at 12 noon, then you're, then you're really in the dark. So it gives light to the world. It gives uh, energy so that you may live, animals may live. So Jesus, as I said, becomes known as God's son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. Now, the second point is that, uh, as we talked about, the rising of the sun, and it's appropriate to say that the S-U-N does rise in the morning, so it is your risen Savior. And so uh, the scripture says in the Bible, in both Deuteronomy and the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, that God is a consuming fire in heaven. That's interesting. In the book of Deuteronomy and in the book of Hebrews, in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, 
uh, it says that God is a consuming fire in heaven. Well, if that isn't the sun, what else is? You know? So, it was accepted that all men were bound to life on the earth, but the sky was the abode of God's Son. He resided up there in heaven. So when you hear Christians today talking about God's Son who is in heaven, well, obviously the Son is in heaven. Where else would it be if it wasn't up in the heavens? Ask a child to go out at night and point up into the sky. What are you looking at? You're not only looking at the sky, but you're looking into heaven. And so at 12 noon, you can look up above your head and you will see God's Son. He is in heaven. And uh, But the idea that when you die, you're going to go to heaven with God's Son. Uh, no, the Son is in heaven, not you. And so it's just symbolic terms that we use. So I'm going to go through these points one by one. We'll start with this point where it says in it was accepted by all men that life on earth was for man, but the sky was the abode of God's Son. He resides up there in heaven, as we said. The next says that ancient man saw in his male offspring his own image and likeness, and his own existence as a father was proved by the person of his son. It was assumed that God's Son was but a visible representative of the unseen Creator in heaven. So it is said in the scriptures that when you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. Or said another way in the Bible, in the New Testament, the Father is glorified in his Son. The idea being is that when you have a male offspring, you call him your Son. And he reflects to the world, you, you are the Father of the Son. And so when they see your son, when, when anyone, whatever happens to your son, anyone talks to him, harms him, does anything to, to him, good or bad, whatever they do to your son, they have done to you because he represents you. Therefore, you're the father and he's the son. So the idea being is that the son, the S-U-N, represents the great creator in the heavens that you cannot see. But uh, but you can see his qualities, God's qualities in his son. As I said, because the son gives life. I mean, there would be no life on the earth if it wasn't for God's son. And there would be nothing to eat and there would be nothing to grow. So it would be horrible on this earth if we didn't have the son. So... Um, Ancient man had no problem understanding that all life on the earth depended directly on the life-giving energy from the sun. Consequently, all life was lost without God's son, S-U-N. It followed that God's son was nothing less than our very savior. And of course, as I said, the son is your savior. If you don't think so, wait till it don't come up. So... The next point is that since energy from the sun gave life and we sustain our very existence by taking energy from our food, which comes from the sun, the sun must give up its life supporting energy so that we might continue to live. It is said that God's sun must give his life for you to live. Well, if you think about energy is life. I mean, if you've got a battery and it has a lot of energy, it's, it's a live battery. But when you drained all the uh, the energy out of the battery, we say the battery's dead. Well, you are a biological battery. You are a biological electrical unit. Your body is. So when you have used up all your energy, we say things like, I'm just dead. I'm dead, tired, I'm dead. But no, it means that your the energy in your body is, is gone. So you're tired, you need to go to sleep because you are just dead meaning that the, the energy in you is gone. So the sun gives up its energy. And so the ancient people said that the energy coming from the sun uh, keeps us alive, obviously. But if the sun were to keep its energy to itself and not give it to everybody else, not give it to the solar system, but it was to keep that energy in itself, then it would last forever. Because it is the symbol, it is the source of all energy. 
for us in our solar system. So if he kept it to himself, he would have plenty of energy and could last forever. But as long as he's giving the energy out freely to all of us on the earth and to our solar system, there's going to come a day, the ancient people said, there will come a day when this sun is going to die because it cannot forever keep giving out uh, uh, its, its, its energy. Somewhere, someday, it will have to die because it's giving all of its energy up. So that's why we say in Christianity that God's son, Jesus, died and gave his life so that we might live. That's right. The son is giving up his life, his energy, so that we on earth might live. Because if it kept the energy, we, we'd be in the dark and we would be dead. So God's son, S-U-N, is giving us his energy, his life, so that we might live. Now, while it is plainly true that our life came from and was sustained each day by our Savior, God's Son, it was and would be true only as long as the Son would return each morning. Our hope of salvation would be secure only in a risen Savior. It was from this that we understand that if he did not rise from the grave of darkness, all would be lost. The whole world would be waiting for his imminent return each morning. So the Father would never leave us at the mercy of the world of darkness. And that's why when it got dark, the ancient Egyptians called the prince of darkness, the evil one in the ancient religions of Egypt, was called Set, S-E-T. Set was the god of darkness, the evil one. And so when God's son, Jesus, dies, each evening when he dies, he leaves the earth in the uh, in the uh, arms of the prince of darkness. Well, of course. And the prince of darkness was called Set. So today, when the sun dies, it's gone. It leaves the whole world, our world, in the arms of the prince of darkness at sunset. <laughs> so, very simple. All of this is very easy to understand once you realize that the entire story of Judaism and Christianity is based on sun worship, on the moon, on the stars. So let's go on. He would, he would come again, and he promised he would return. Well, he does every morning about 5.30. Logically, even if man himself died, as long as the sun came up each morning, life on the earth would continue forever. Therefore, it is said in the ancient text that everlasting life was the gift that God gives to the world through his Son. The scripture actually says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that we may have everlasting life. That's true. God, the divine presence in the universe, has given his only begotten Son and our solar system is the only one. So it's God's only begotten Son, and he has given God's Son to us that we may have everlasting life on earth. Not you personally. You won't have everlasting life. But on the earth, as long as the sun comes up, there's going to be life on the earth. So that's why the scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that we may have life forever everlasting life on the earth. Not you having everlasting life, but the earth will have it. So the next point is, since evil and harm lurk at every turn in the fearful darkness of night, all evil and harmful deeds were naturally referred to as the works of darkness. So that's why all evil things happen in darkness. That's why you know, robbers are not going to do it in the daytime. They're going to rob at night. So the evil things that happen, we call them works of darkness because they usually happen at night. With the return of the sun each morning, man felt more secure in his world and therefore was at peace. Therefore, God's sun, S-U-N, was with his rays of hope referred to as the prince of peace because the sun, when it rose in the morning, brought light into the world 
And now all the fearful things of night have fled away, and now we can see everything clearly. So he was referred to as the great Prince of Peace, God's Son. And of course, the reverse was equally true. The evil of night was ruled over by none other than the Prince of Darkness. The evil is dark. And so darkness is evil, so you put a D, the letter D, in front of the word evil, it becomes devil. The next point is that it was only a short step to see that the light of God's Son equated with righteousness and truth. We do that today. Anytime we're talking about truth and light, we're talking about equating righteousness and truth with light. And therefore, the evil was equated with darkness. So from then on, it was very simple to understand. The light was good and the dark was evil, which also happens to give us, give us the basis for our racism. The light-colored people are good, the, the dark-colored people are bad, because light in the daytime is good and darkness at night is bad. So going on, the next point is that that being true, that light is good and darkness is evil, then the great orb of day, God's sun, could rightly say of itself, the sun could say of itself, I am the light and the truth. And no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. Well, of course, the sun could say, I am the light of the world and I am the truth. Because obviously, Anything in the dark, you can't tell if it's true. But when it's in broad daylight, you can, you can prove something to be right or wrong. So that's why Jesus has said, I am the light of the world. I am the light and the truth. And no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. What that is saying is very simple, symbolically, that if you're going to, if you're going to present yourself before God, you need to do it in the spirit of light and truth, not with your religion. Your religion doesn't buy you anything. But uh, if you're going to talk to God, then you better go with intellectual, spiritual enlightenment and the truth. Because uh, anything less than truth and, and light is not going to play well with the universe. So if you, you know, if, if you got a religion, just forget your religion. If you're going to talk to God, you better, you better do it with the light and truth. And so then we say, well, we should all give thanks to our Father for sending his Son. For peace and tranquility he brings to our life is what we call solace, S-O-L-A-C-E. Solace is from the word sola, for the Son. So God's Son, Jesus, gives solace to our life. It makes us feel better about everything because we know God's Son, Jesus, and so the, all, the idea that we're making, that Jesus makes us feel better about everything, we call that solas, S-O-L-A-C-E. Look it up in the dictionary. Coming from the word sola. So we now have before us two cosmic brothers, the Prince of Darkness and the Light of the World. The one very good and the one very bad. One brings the truth to light, with the light of truth. And the other is the opposite, or the opposition to light, the opposer, the prince of the world of darkness. So the bottom line on Christianity is that God's Son is the light of the world, and his great enemy is the prince of darkness, the devil, D in front of the word evil. And it is at this point that we come to Egypt, more than 3,000 years before Christianity began. The early morning sun, which was the Savior, was, pic was pictured in Egypt as a newborn baby. And the infant Savior's name was Horus. So we've seen that in Egyptian uh, books and on religion of the ancient Egyptians, that the newborn sun, when it first breaks on the horizon in the east in the, new, in the early morning, uh, that sun was called the newborn savior. He is just now coming to life for the earth. And so he's the newborn, and his name was Horus, H-O-R-U-S, Horus. And so we find that um, 
the early morning, the new early morning sun, or the newborn baby, was pictured in two ways. Horus was either the dove, he was pictured as a dove, as a bringer of peace, or sometimes he was pictured as a hawk, the god of war, who punishes the enemies of God. So today, in government, especially in America, we still have these terms, the hawks and the doves. The hawk was, uh, was Horus, and the doves uh, was uh, the god of war. So the sun was called Horus when he awoke in the morning. Now at daybreak, this wonderful newborn child, the sun, is of course born again. So we say hallelujah, which means praise to Yahweh and praise to that God his son is born again, and that Horus, H-O-R-U-S, is risen. Even today, when the sun comes up, as we see it, we call it the sun in the morning, we say Horus is risen. So we have a word uh, called horizon. Horizon is Horus risen. So even today, the sun comes up on the horizon, so his life was also divided. We find out that the son's life was divided into 12 parts, or 12 Horuses. In the ancient Egyptian religion, they said that Horus had 12 uh, lives, and he had 12 steps. And he walked, across step, he walked across heaven in 12 steps, or 12 Horuses. So in the morning when it came up, it was Horus of the first step. A little bit later, it was Horus of the second step, and then Horus of the third step. And so he walked across the sky in 12 steps, which gives us our 12-step programs today. You start in the first grade, and you go to the 12th grade. Alcoholics have a 12-step program. So, and, and when you walk into a courtroom, they'll always have 12 jurors. It's a 12-step program. So the 12 steps are the 12 hours of day that the sun, God's son, his name is Horus, walks across the sky in 12 steps, 12 Horuses. So we today take the word H-O-R-U-S, Horus, and interchange the R and the U to U and R. Therefore, H-O-R-U-S becomes H-O-U-R-S, 12 hours. So the 12 Horuses that walk across the sky in 12 steps are the 12 hours, not Horus. But then, what about the evil brother of God's son, the old prince of darkness himself? Well, in the ancient Egyptian belief system, as I said, he was called, the devil was called Set. And we're told in the Bible that when God's son dies, the world is left in the hands of the prince of darkness, son set. So, if you're understanding what I'm saying is that the entire story in the New Testament, and in the Old, but especially the New Testament, is nothing more than astrotheology, or the telling of the oldest story in the world, the war between the sun and of day, the risen Savior, and the prince of darkness at night. So, let's go on with this article. It was generally observed that God's Son could be depended upon to return in the same manner that he left, namely, on a cloud. And so in the scriptures it says that every eye will see him, unless, of course, you're blind or dead. And so the Bible says that every eye will see God's Son when he comes back. Well, of course every eye sees the Son when he comes back. And it is said that uh, God's son, the, the scripture says that God's son, when he left the world, he left on a cloud. And he gave a prophecy that he, he said, just as I am leaving on a cloud, I will come back on a cloud. That's in the Bible and the New Testament. Uh, that Jesus said he would come back in a cloud because he left in a cloud. Well, that's the way the sun works, if you'll ever notice. At nighttime, when the sun's going down, there's uh, clouds out there. So the sun leaves the world on a cloud. And in the morning, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there are clouds and the sun comes up on a cloud. So Jesus is actually God's son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. So keeping in mind that God's son, S-U-N, was not only represented as the light of truth, 
but was put to death by his enemies who could not endure the light of truth in their life. It was taught by the ancient peoples that it, the very act of opposing or denying the light of truth is to, point, is to the point of killing it. It happens in one's own mind. So when we're confronted with harsh realities of life, the light of the truth, which we do not wish to face, and which runs counter to our religious views, such truth is put to death in your mind, in your head. Therefore, it is said that God's Son, who called himself the truth and the light, and of course the Son is the truth and the light, is put to death in the scriptures, it says that he was put to death in the place of the skull, or skull place, Golgotha. Well, of course, that's where you put to death. The truth and the light is in your head. So it's located somewhere between the ears. This is putting the death, the putting to death the light of hope in your mind is always accompanied by two thieves. So we say that there were two thieves that were raised by, uh, uh, that were on the cross next to Jesus. On one side was regret for the past, and then the other side was fear of the future. And so the scripture says that Jesus, God's son, died on a place called Golgotha. Uh, Golgotha it simply means place of the skull. Well, as I said, that's where you put to death the light of truth is in your head, your skull. God's son dies at Golgotha's skull place. And, of course, God's son goes to his death wearing a corona. We talked about that before, the corona, which is a Latin word for crown of thorns. Remember the Statue of Liberty? And to this day, kings still wear round crowns of thorns, like in Hawaii. All kings wear crowns of thorns because it's a coronation, corona. Going on with this, uh, this idea of the son being Jesus, S-U-N. God's S-U-N, God's Son, brought his wonderful light to the world, equally distributed over 12 months. So it is said that God's Son had 12 companions or helpers that assisted in his life-saving work. And so it was God's Son had 12 apostles, or 12 months of the year, who followed him religiously through his life. Incidentally, now that you know why the American jury system has 12 jurors who help bring the truth to light before the great judge. So the 12 apostles are the 12 months of the year, or the 12 signs of the zodiac. And incidentally, that's why if you have the 12 signs of the zodiac, or the 12 months of the year, which are the 12 followers of God's Son, so you take the 12 plus the master as the son, that makes it 13. That's what 13 is an unlucky number. The Jesus and, the, and his chosen 12. Now as far as we can go back into ancient world, we find that all known cultures have a three and one triune God. This is very interesting because most people don't know that, that almost all the ancient cultures of the world pictured their God as a three-and-one God, a triune God. Uh, the very first trinity was simply the three stages of life of the sun. Newborn in the morning, that's, that's the newborn babe. Then full-grown at 12 noon, the mature God is at 12 noon. He was referred to as the most high. Well, of course, they don't get any higher than noon. We call it high noon because the sun is as high as it's going to get at noon. So he's newborn in the morning, he's the baby. And then he's mature at 12 noon, and then of course he's old and dying at the end of day. He's going back to the Father. So all three of the concept of the triune God was actually one divinity. The, therefore, if you understand what I'm saying, the Trinity is said to be a great mystery. No, the Trinity is not a mystery. It's the Son in the three stages, the early morning, the child, Horus the younger, and then at full noon at 12, and then the dying God at, at night. So it's the three, it's the three gods in one. 
It's the same sun god, so it's only one god but three divine persons. Baby, full-grown, and old man dying at night. And therefore, Horus the Elder was referred to in the ancient Egyptians as the Amun or Amun Re, the king of the gods, the triune god of Thebes. Uh, the god uh, of the sun was called Amun, A M E N hyphen R A, Amun Re or Amun Ra. And so today, uh, when Christians are praying to God, even the scripture says, no man can see God, but you can see his son. And so the sun was called in the ancient Egyptian Amun, A-M-E-N hyphen R-A, Amun Ra. And so today Christians say that they go to church and they will pray to God's son, the light of the world, and at the end of their prayer they say amen. And then you ask them, why are you praying to Jesus? They said, well, because Christians will tell you, well, we can't talk to God directly. You can only talk to his son and he will deliver the, the, the prayer to the Father. So that's exactly right. It's the, uh, it's the whole idea of Amun Ray. The Ray it comes from our word for sun ray, for the sun. So when you've seen the sun, you've seen the Father. So this is why Christians at the end of their prayer say amen, because they're sending their prayer to God through God's Son, the light of the world. What am I saying here? Basically what I'm saying is that Christianity is nothing more than the telling of an old ancient story. It's called the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told is called astrotheology or the worship of the heavens, the worship of God's son. And of course it is God's son. It doesn't belong to the Chinese. It doesn't belong to Africa or to America or to anybody anybody else on the earth. Well, who does the son belong to? Well, it belongs to God. So it's God's son. And he's the three divine persons in one. Yeah, the, the child in the morning, the full grown at noon, and the and the old man at night. Three divine persons in one God. There is no mystery to the uh, Trinity. It's very simple. Now, we we'll go on with this. The ancient Egyptians knew that the sun was at its highest point in the sky at high noon, when no shadow was cast on the pyramid. And so at that point, all the Egyptians offered prayers to the Most High God. As stated before, to the ancients, the sky was the abode or the heavenly temple of the Most High. Therefore, God's Son was doing his heavenly Father's work in the temple at 12. So we've got all these ideas and pictures in the Bible and the New Testament that Jesus, at 12 years old, was in the temple teaching the wise men. No, the, not 12 years old. The Son was in the heavens. The temple of, of God is in the heavens. And so the sky is the abode of God. And God's heavenly temple is in the heaven. And therefore, God's Son, the light of the world, is in the heavens teaching the universe, teaching everyone the truth at 12 noon. That's why it's called high noon, because he is the most high God. So that story about Jesus being 12 years old in the temple is a misunderstanding. No, it's the Son at 12 noon. And Jesus was teaching in God's uh, heavenly temple. Well, the heavenly temple is the sky. And so um, that's a misunderstanding that Jesus was teaching anyone at 12 years old. Now, the next point is that the world of ancient man kept track of these times and seasons by the movement of the sun. Daily, monthly, and yearly movements of the sun. For this, the sundial was devised. Not only the daily movement of the sun was tracked on a round, a round sundial, but the whole year was chartered on a round calendar dial. Examples are the ancient Mexican, Mayans, and Incas, the Aztecs, Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Celtic, Celtic, etc. All had the same idea and the concept of a round solar disk as a disk for the sun, to keep track of the sun, <clears throat> so that the whole year was on a round sun dial. 
since the earth experienced four different seasons, all at the same and equal time in the year, the round sun calendar was divided into four equal parts. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Four equal parts of the year. This represented the complete story of the life of God's Son. Of course, the four seasons of the year tell you the whole story of the life of God's Son. This was also why we have in the Bible the four Gospels. On this point, there can be no doubt. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, and many of the early church fathers after him, stated this themselves, that the uh, four Gospels were based on the four seasons of the year, since Jesus is God's Son, and he has 12 apostles of the 12 followers of God's Son of the 12 months of the year, then the four Gospels are the four seasons in which the story of God's Son and his 12 helpers is given to us. So that's where the four Gospels come from. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spring, summer, autumn, winter. This is why the famous painting of the Last Supper pictures 12 followers of the Son in groups of four. So if you ever get a chance to go back and see that beautiful painting of the what is called the Last Supper, you will see that there are 12 apostles with Jesus in the middle. The Son is in the middle of the 12. And each one of the, uh, and each three of uh, the apostles are gathered in four different groups of three. That's right. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. What do you think, guys? I think it's a good idea to stop here because there's so much more I want to talk about. 